procedure which would uh, reduce genetic. Huh? Genetic or yeah. yeah. And they they begun working with drugs. I mean, before soldiers go into combat in Iraq, they were given drugs to sort of try to approximate that as well. There's a story that's coming out in the New York Times over the next several weeks that's going to deal with this issue some. There was a general, um, retired three-star general, Robert Latif, who had an op-ed in the New York Times last summer uh, talking about modification of soldiers and how this would change the sort of ethics of combat. Uh, because if you have no re uh, response to violence, then what will you do? Um, and that also, if there are modified soldiers, how will they reintegrate into society? Mm -hmm. um, also questions just about with the increasing automation on the battlefield, uh, will soldiers be expected to sacrifice their lives to save a $50 million machine, for example, because of that kind of uh, activity. I have a, a piece that I've written, it was actually, most, most of it was in the Concord Monitor on Thursday, if, uh, that outlines some of that. You know, there was also at the Harvard Medical School, just after we shot this film, um, a meeting spoke, folk, of, of doctors and scientists focused on the current state of, te of progress on the issue of the artificial genome. So the idea of creating humans with no biological parents. And the first utilization, it was a front page story in the New York Times that was, art that was mentioned was soldiers, you know, in terms of specifically genetically designed uh, humans that would actually mature very fast also. So that you could actually get somebody to a physical adulthood in like four years. Um, anyway, it's weird stuff. And so, um, and, and there was a, there's actually online, you can see a, a, uh, there's a, a press conference by Obama talking about what he called the super soldier that was now in the works. And he sort of made it into a little bit of a joke. He said, uh, you can't believe what, what's going on. He said, in fact, I'm likely to fly off any minute right here. Mm -hmm. And everybody laughed. And he said, um, well, not really. And then he said, uh, well, actually, yeah, really. Mm -hmm. He said, but it's classified. Uh, so yeah, I mean, um, this question of modification. There, there's some questions about, you know, implants, brain implants, that will have this impact to interrupt. I mean, they've identified the gene associated with trauma and traumatic response to violence. And so the issue is now, how do they best, you know, splice that gene, change that gene, mutate that gene. And so that's sort of where it is. If you, I'd be happy to send you my piece on it. Uh, if you give me your email address, I can do that. Um, I mean, there are other issues, you know, expendability became another issue, and we put research into that. The Supreme Court ruled in 1987 that the government can do whatever they want to you, and you have no recourse. Uh, it was a five to four decision that grew out of the project called MKUltra, when the military and the CIA were giving LSD to unsuspecting um, people in, like, bars and... Uh, soldiers in their off-duty time and stuff, and then they weren't told, and some of them went a little nuts, and some committed suicide, and s some became unstable, and blah, blah, blah. And there was a lawsuit. It took a long time to come through the courts, but in 1987, there was a lawsuit that the Supreme Court ruled five to four in favor of the government's ability to, you know, experiment with, um, and even if it resulted in death or serious, you know, injury. Experiment with soldiers, or anyone? it was well. These were, I think, most of the people in the MK Ultra program were soldiers. Uh, some of them were off duty or whatever. They were unsuspecting. They were in bars. They were in places like that. Um, but I mean, it's it's an important precedent, and it it had to do with government um, necessity. I mean, the government decides to do something because, of course. Um, and, there can be collateral damage, and there have been cases where there have been some settlement prior to this, uh, but well, this one person pushed the case, and both William uh, Brennan and Sandra Day O'Connor wrote very stinging dissents, citing the Nuremberg precedents and blah, 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 but 
Uh, so this notion of expendability, that if you are in this situation, you know, that like Jack and Kay, you know, t to a certain extent, I mean, and then you get into the question, well, are they working on government contract, or are they working on a private contract, is it private research? You know, I mean, it just it becomes very complex, but there will be a whole new set of ethics and rules and litigation over new technologies, including genetic technologies. And the question is, you know, where will it end to a certain extent? It's safe to say you made this film out of fear? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, I mean, I, I mean, first of all, I mean, the sense, there's a science fiction writer, William Gibson, said the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. <laughs> <laughs> and to a certain extent, that's what I was, you know, because I show this in Vermont, people say, this isn't a Vermont film. I say, well, the National Center for PTSD is in White River Junction, and this is what they're working on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the, so it's like, but we don't think of that, you know, and it's, it's, um, it's partly, I mean, you know, the, when the Iranian uh, strike, retaliatory strike happened, everybody's fine, no injuries. Mm -hmm. And then, it, like, last week came out, no, there's 11 traumatic brain injuries. And yesterday, it's like, no, there are 34 traumatic brain injuries. Well, what's that all about? You know, I mean, it's just, um, it's, and, and one, it's almost hard to imagine that, you know, combat will extend forever. I mean, after World War II, it seems to me, the Europeans sort of said, we don't want to do this anymore, yeah. you know? But they're, sort of, they're starting to get sort of sucked back into it. But this notion of militarism and technology and soldiers and unending war against terrorism, I mean, Dick Cheney said when, after 9-11 that the war on terrorism would go at least 75 years, which means forever yeah. at some level. But, you know, so this question of diplomacy versus you know, I, I don't know, um, but this, the, the, after, re, after having this experience making the, the, the documentary about combat veterans and then encountering this information from, um, from the National Center for PTSD and then the guy who started the National Center for PTSD, who was an activist psychiatrist who opened storefront clinics in Vermont after the Vietnam War to work with, because PTSD was not acknowledged. Uh, and he led the fight to get it acknowledged. He was unsuccessful getting the Pentagon to recognize it and finally got an act of Congress to recognize it. Um, has now retired from his position as the head of the National Center for PTSD and he's now collecting veterans' brains for a, for a uh, depository in Boston that is being used for understanding better the the genetics and the um, and just the, the responses the brain responses to PTSD and they're mostly brains from soldiers that had PTSD. Yeah, um, I've read that um, the uh, children of uh, Holocaust survivors uh, have changed genetics uh -huh. from. Sure their parents, and it would be, it, uh, my mind wonders if you change the genetics of somebody going into war when they come back from war, uh, if they're desensitized to the trauma, then are their children less right. sensitized? Right, yeah, and if, and, and if this programming takes place, I mean, are there civil rights issues involved also in all of that? Yeah, yeah. so... Yeah, so I thought, you know, I mean, I was at a point, I made all these sort of North Country, you know, Westerns, basically. And, uh, and, and I just felt that, you know, also surveillance technology, and, and suddenly everything, we're, we're under total surveillance all the time, <laughs> you know. I mean, I, the 60s, of course, was your phone being tapped, right? Now, every stroke of the keyboard is basically, you know, registered. And so this notion of a surveillance economy, and uh, I, mean, I mean, culture and visual surveillance and video surveillance and so that all these things just sort of interested me read this book that sort of created this very vivid sort of visual world and that sort of interested me I mean we're working very low budget here I mean the average Hollywood movies made for a budget of six sixty five million dollars with another fifty million dollars for marketing we made this for seven hundred and forty thousand dollars you know so very low budget uh, even compared to my earlier films which were basically two million dollar films so the idea is to try to work with, you know, very limited budget, but still try to make a film that, you know, 
has an interesting story and goes somewhere with it. And, uh, we have interesting sort of cameo performances, I should probably, just as a trivial piece. Um, Jerry O'Connell, you know, but the, uh, the guy Mashita, the tall um, uh, guy at Galapagos, is the son of J.D. Salinger. Uh, the cop at the beginning, who the woman cop that brings the guy into the place, is the daughter of Warren Zevon. Uh, the guy who's selling the pharmaceuticals uh, to Briggs is the son of Howard Zinn. The clock is the granddaughter of Charlie Chaplin. And the, uh, the, the guard, you know, who you see at the end there again, is actually Robert Altman's very long time uh, assistant director who also wrote uh, um, Secret Honor and The Wedding for Altman, was in Nashville and, you know, and was in the uh, original Broadway production of Hair. So is there some code from all of those, those insertions? Should we be able to, to write a script out of Absolutely. the selections that you made for the <laughs> cameos? Sure. Yeah. Right. No, it was, it was just sort of a coming together. It wasn't really intended, but it just sort of happened. But uh, it, was sort of, it was sort of fun. You had a question? Yeah, I, I, I thought you did a really good job of, of positioning the future and the present, you know, for the most part, with a few interesting life choices and such. But, uh, and, but it, you were assisted by something that occur, occurred to me while I was watching this, that, you know, there was a, there was a I guess it was a 70s book called, called Future Shock. Uh -huh. and, and, I, it, and I think we're past all that. Now, now we live in this state of future dread. Right. Because we know that... that it's all that, that our undoing is is already there. You know, there's AI. There's we're, we're going to be taken over by robots. The climate's going to change. We're going to drown. You know, and and, uh, and so all, it, we're pretty much doomed. You know, so we're sort of living in this in this little you know pre-apocalyptic pre-apocalyptic uh, zone. We're just waiting for yeah. it to happen, we're, and it'll be something that you know that's been there forever that we just didn't know about. You know, some little twist of genetic engineering or AI fused mm -hmm. with you know a, a certain chemical and suddenly bang we're, we're obsolete and so there's a little bit of that behind all of this right sure but it's like it's you see it all the time you, you were hearing about you know self-driving cars and oh but they wreck and you know we're, uh, uh, a retro engineering you know alien technology and right. all of this stuff it seems all so plausible that our you know the future is, is here to, to get us <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, I've never been a big sci-fi person, as I say, these sort of, but, but suddenly I just, I had this feeling that the future is here. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of my response to, in some ways, the current political situation. I mean, the current debate in Washington is whether we just forget the Constitution <clears throat> and, and whether, we're gonna, whether we're willing to allow this precedent to establish itself, which is that, for one thing, Congress no longer has oversight to the executive. Because once you go with that, then you've done it you know, to a certain extent, but it seems sort of futuristic to me in terms of just, and also all the surveillance. You know, mm -hmm. nobody gave permission on this stuff. And in fact, there, were, there have been bills passed in Congress over the last several years that basically just allow all of this to happen, you know. And so this notion of just how much, because we, 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 we like our, to think of ourselves as this democracy and, and certainly have been in significant ways and it's not like it's all going out the window but there are serious encroachments on it. And so it seems sort of futuristic to me a little bit. I mean it's one notion of a future. It's, it's what, you know, whether it was George Orwell or, um, you know, Huxley or, you know, just various writers have sort of pointed to some of this possibility, but yes, and it is what it is, and it's particular to the technology and the culture that we find ourselves, you know, sort of now facing. It seems to have happened also very quickly. I mean, we're old enough to remember the 50s and 60s, you know, to a certain extent, and this, this is a lot of rapid change, you know, when you think about it. But yeah, I mean, it's something to think about. Yes, in the back. It seemed a paradox that there wasn't as much future, like the car still had a driver, right? but yet the alarm clock has a person that can walk right out. Right. So it looked like, you know, intentionally a mix of now sure. and the future. Right. Because, I mean, you know, in thinking of near future, I mean, this could be 10 or 12 years from now, yeah. sort of the idea. Um, and yes, w w are all the cars going to be self-driving cars? I don't know. But I, I do know that we couldn't afford to make that happen in the movie. <laughs> and, and, you know, the question is, you know, uh, what 
you know, the physical landscape is not going to substantially look different, but there will be differences. It's not like every building is going to be rebuilt in some futuristic way. I mean, buildings are buildings, right? And we have buildings still playing here from the 18th century, right? And so, um, so that's the idea. Yes, there's a mix of now and then. And that it's not that far off, but it, but it is not now. Yeah, and, and there are assumptions that are different than what we have now. It felt to me as if I was watching a movie that had been made in the 1980s uh -huh. about some sure. future time, sure. which might even be past from now. It almost feels like we're beyond. We're future. probably beyond that, yeah, sure. Yeah, and that's, so that notion of timelessness, yeah. I venture to say that it, in a way it didn't even seem like sci-fi to me. Yeah, right. You know. I, I guess that's the genre right. you have to put it you, in. You're sort of placed somewhere, yeah. You have to put it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, please. Oh, no, well, just, no you're, you, please. Okay, um, I just want to ask about distribution. Because sure. Because I think it's so important for people to see the film. Thank you. Uh, for that. all of the many reasons that you've articulated and others have. Um, and my only other comment is that I think development is uneven to the whatever this future is going to be, so it yeah. didn't surprise me that we saw the area. Right. You know, the clock, the person coming out of the clock with the cars, you know. Yeah. I understand the real reasons you didn't have self-driving cars. But right. But also, I don't think we know what the... I guess the, the cars may be in that whole sort of weird sort of motif, probably are self-driving. I mean, self are, are people going to be on the battlefield as ro not people, are robots going to be there very soon? Some people are saying yes, and they're aspects of that with drones, I mean, a lot of that, because I am a child of the 50s and 60s, um, is been very quick. You know, we're killing yeah. people robotically. The drone is certainly a robot, yeah. you know, uh, and, and it's being, it's being commanded by people robot. sitting in Virginia and Colorado. Right. You know. We'll also have PTSD with this. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, it's... Uh, so it kind of ties to And interestingly enough, the National Center for PTSD, which struggled so hard to finally get established and now is totally established, is overwhelmed because they're not only having to deal with military PTSD, they're also contacted after Hurricane Katrina or the tsunami in Asia or, you know, rape victims. And, you know, I mean, just there is so much sort of traumatic stuff that they are swamped. They can't possibly deal with it. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking about all the children. Now we have the acronym ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, mm -hmm. and some mm -hmm. children of perhaps parents who had opioid overdoses. Sure. Um, they're just talking about that. So how does all of that fit in and modifying, you know, potentially sure. their brains? Um, That's, and yeah. as others said, does that get then transmitted? And how do you how do you select out what you're modifying them for? Because right. I didn't want to lose the thread of the well, question about distribution. Sure. Um, but one of the things about, about genetic it. modification, which Briggs also talks about, is that when you make genetic modifications, unexpected things yes. happen. Yeah. There is stuff that happens that you cannot predict. And that, I mean, if you, you can get a genetically modified cat, right? And you want a cat that doesn't have a tail, right? And people do that. And then, but they get leukemia. You know what I'm saying? And that's like nobody expected that. Well, that, that already happened with some surgeries a number of years ago, and they, they stopped it. Yeah. It's a very, it's an infant science, let's put it that way. And so, but where the way, but it's being applied aggressively, and there's all this sort of ambition for what it can do. Uh, distribution. Uh, you know, the world of distribution for independent filmmakers is by far worse than it's ever been. Um, and so...